What's up guys, welcome back to Fraud on the Telly. In today's video, we're going over every Easter egg and reference I could find in The Legend of Vox Machina episodes 10 to 12. The Briarwood arc has finally concluded, and wow, what a banger the last few episodes were. As always, make sure you go check out some of our other Easter egg videos for previous episodes. Episodes 10 to 12, unlike many previous episodes, have far less hidden Easter eggs, like items and such, and seem to have more references or direct lines taken from Campaign 1. So please, if I've missed anything, let me know in the comments below. Obviously, this video gonna contain spoilers, Okay, for all the episodes up until now of The Legend of Vox Machina as well as Campaign 1. We begin as Percy and the gang have just found Ripley in the cells of Whitestone. The group are worried about Percy as they've noticed he's become, let's say, unhinged as of late. Percy relents on killing Ripley at this moment, saying, You are the luckiest person in Whitestone. Do you know why? Because you're at the bottom of my list. This is a direct line from Taliesin taken in from Campaign 1. Pike, being a cleric of Saren Ray, wants to help Percy. She touches his chest and looks upon his soul. She sees he is a burn with flame and smoke. Obviously, this is Orthax, Percy's shadow demon. This scene parallels a scene in the campaign where Pike casts greater restoration on Percy, curing him of some of the corruption. When she does so, she's given a similar vision, but it's not nearly as intense and telling as the one in the animated show. They make their way deeper underground until they arrive at the Dorolo Crypt. Vax lights his flame tongue dagger for, I think, the first time in the whole series. Vax had three unique daggers in Campaign 1 that he carries with him. The flame tongue dagger, the poisoned, and the dagger of life stealing. In the crop, there's a symbol of the sun tree here, a little foreshadowing to events that will take place in the future. We get a little classic Vax-Grog banter as Grog makes Vax tell him how awesome he is before he opens the door. Something they did quite often to each other. The party ventures on underground until they come upon a room that was used as a whitestone refinery. The sixth barrel on Percy's list suddenly glows, the name Cassandra Jarolo being etched in it. Remember back when Scanlan asked who the sixth barrel was for? Surprise, surprise! Cassandra is under the control of Lord Briarwood and traps the party within the refinery room. Cassandra explains to Percy that he has done this to himself, the day he abandoned her when he escaped. In a series of lines taken almost directly from the campaign, she says, I have a new family now. I'm a Briarwood. Vax finds himself once again alone with Lord and Lady Briarwood. Like last time, it doesn't end too well, as Silas uses his vampire magic to charm him, just like he does in the campaign. As in the campaign, the room begins to fill with acid, but the party manages to stop it. This whole scene had a ton of differences from the show to the campaign in exactly how they got out of the city situation, but I do think I prefer what happened in the show. We get a first look at the Ziggurat, a massive temple-like structure beneath Whitestone that was hinted at earlier in the show when Scanlan was reading Delilah's book. Take a look at this fan art of the Ziggurat by at son of Joxer on Twitter. Super cool similarities to the art direction they decided to go with in the campaign. Notice the Ziggurat was built beneath the large sun tree as its roofs fall down from above. Finally, we get our Vecna meta unlock as the Briarwood's plan is revealed. They want to bring back the fallen god to our plane of existence. The group engage the Briarwoods in battle as Percy walks forward yelling Silas names just like he does in the campaign. A little side note, this series of animation of the final fight with the Briarwoods was freaking crazy. So much detail and effort was put into every character's movement and attacks, it just seems like everything had a thought behind it. I gotta give it the praise it deserves. Scandal attempts to cast a spell, but find that he cannot speak. Delilah has cast the Silent spell on him. In the campaign, the spell used here was Pounder spell. It seems that they just replaced this with Silent, which is fine because essentially it serves the same purpose. Through multiple scenes, we get glimpses of Percy's demon Orthax and its form, who is described in the campaign as having a long hooked beak like a nose, somewhat similar to Percy's mask. Pike saves Scanlan from Lady Briarwood as we see his eyes change to little d20s with hearts in them. Keyleth casts the spell Sunbeam, a spell that in the show she has struggled with. A nice little character progression line. This was actually Vox Machina's main plan of attack in the campaign, as they know Silas is a vampire, Sunlight being his natural enemy. Thus, the plan was to somehow restrain him so they could focus the beam on him. Lord Briarwood and Grog go for round two. We get to see more of Lord Briarwood's sword, Craven Edris has the ability to sack strength from his enemies and making him stronger. The Lord attempts to charm the massive Goliath, but in the show, Grog closes his eyes to avoid the charm, swinging wildly until he hits. This is a common trope in D&D, as many monsters or enemies have abilities that work through eye contact, so many D&D players are forced to fight these things with their eyes closed to defeat them. In the campaign, it was actually Grog's barbarian ability, Rage, which prevented him from being charmed by the Lord Briarwood, as he is unable to pierce his mind. Caitlyn, in an awesome character progression moment, channels her light beam, which burns away part of Silas's face, a direct reference to events that happened in the campaign. 
Grog holds Silas in place as Keyless blasts him directly. Some Goku Piccolo style here, with the Sunbeam destroying the vampire. Keyleth in the campaign during the battle actually runs up and hugs Silas, casting the Sunbeam directly point blank at him. Later in the campaign when Silas refers to its misform, it is Keyleth who finishes off with another blast of light. Scanlan returns the favor for Delilah having blocked his spell with counterspell, or silence, by doing the same to her. Scanlan throughout the campaign became the clutch king for his use of counterspell. In the campaign, Delilah, seeing the battle isn't going their way, attempts to dimension door herself and her husband away, but Scanlan, having stayed within 60 feet, hits the clutch's scounter spell, preventing them from escaping. After the death of her husband, Delilah escapes deeper in the ziggurat, giving us one of my absolutely favorite direct quotes from campaign one, Silas, I broke the world for us. The walls of the ziggurat are covered with wriggling bodies, as these are the lost souls who will be sacrificed to bring Vecna back. Overlooking the door of the inner chamber of the ziggurat is what looks like a D6. Delilah attempts to complete the spell summoning Vecna, carving the same symbol into her other arm. We actually get our first look at the physical form of one of the biggest baddies of all, the Whispered One, Vecna. A sorcerer who extended his life as an archlift through necromancy, and over time amassed enough followers that he would ascend to godhood. Delilah casts the spell Finger of Death, one of the scariest spells in all of D&D. The spell is intended for Vex, but in the show, Keela steps in front, mortally wounding her. In the campaign, this spell actually hits Vex, nearly killing her outright as she lives on 1 HP. Vecna appears and then vanishing, leaving a behind a black spinning orb. In the campaign, this orb was already here, just not spinning, and it was Lady Briarwood's incantation and her rubbing of blood across it that causes it to spin, thus sucking energy into it. Pike attempts to heal Keyleth in the show, but the spell fails. The Gorb has created an anti-magic field, so no spells or magical item work within its area. In the campaign, Vex drank a potion of flying that would then wear off when the orb started sucking in magic causing her to fall from an extremely high distance, knocking her unconscious and putting her on the brink of death. So basically in the campaign, just substitute Keyleth for Vex in these scenes, and bingo bingo bongo, you got it. Grog picks up Silas' sword, Craven Edge. It seems he almost becomes lost in the blade until Scanlan snaps him out of it. This is Omega foreshadowing, by the way, to future events with this sword. Craven Edge is a magical blade that is also possessed by a dark entity that speaks to its user. Percy begins to lose control, as the demon inside of him pushes him on for revenge and to kill Delilah. Finally, we see Orthax's demon form appear, a large smoke entity with a beak-like face and claws. Percy loses control as Orthax shows him visions of his mortal enemies. Pretty sure that's a D20 as well in this book right here. Finally, it's revealed that Percy has made a contract with Orthax, who gifted him the knowledge to construct the pistol in order to take revenge. Orthax would claim Percy's soul if Percy were to take every name on the list. Percy fights for control as Orthax shows him visions of his dead family. We see the barrel's name shift from Cassandra, Vixalia, to Grog, the demon wanting to take Percy's closest loved ones away from him. In a scene paralleling the campaign, Percy turns the gun on himself, eventually shooting a hole in his own hand, causing the demon to vanish. In the campaign, the entire group, including Percy actually, face off against Orthax, and it is Grog who eventually takes down the demon by ripping its head off. Oh, I also love this line in the fight of, he has to reload eventually, an obvious reference to firearms being displayed in many shows and movies where it seems like characters have an infinite supply of bullets, a trope that up until now, The Legend of Vox Machina has completely avoided, as we see Percy constantly having to reload and his gun breaking. I just want to give another shout out to Titmouse real quick, the animation studio who did this show, because oh my god, some of the scenes in this fight scene with Orthax and the Vox Machina are absolutely insane. Just take a look at some of these details of the demon. It feels like they took a lot of influence from Tokyo Ghoul kind of in here, but maybe that's just my weeb showing. Like in the campaign, it is Cassandra who takes the life of Lady Briarwood. In more scenes that parallel the campaign, they throw Delilah's corpse into the acid. Scanlan then manages to sneak Percy's pistol away from him. In the campaign, he does so with magic. He then throws it into the acid. Percy's pissed because that costs a lot of money, but when he does so, a poke of black smoke emerges from the acid, finally completely severing the connection of the demon with Percy. We get another reference to the alcove, a medical item shop within Whitestone that the party visits in the campaign. Also, I think this is a Matt Mercer sighting, maybe not, but it does kind of look like Matt's Geralt form. We get a little more insight to the spinning ball of death as we see it suck in all those around it. In the campaign, the Cardi discover this by Keyless summoning Fey Spirits, I believe, who ends up walking into the ball and are sucked in it. This describes and casts her transport via plant spell, a spell Vox Machina used regularly to fast travel around the world in campaign one. A spell that Keyless player Marisha often forgets exactly how it works, or would confuse it with another spell, Tree Spride. We're taken back to Castle Grayskull, a sweet, soothing version of your turn to roll plays over the scenes. Percy has constructed his gauntlet diplomacy, which in this show he wears on the hand that he has shot. 
In the campaign, Percy's actually developed this gauntlet much earlier on. It has the ability to emit lightning shocks to anyone he touches once it is properly charged. We see he has constructed a new pistol as well out of Ripley's old one, named Animus. We get one more door joke for good measure as Grog, as Grog struggles to repair this door. Pike runs over to him, the book in her hand being Tusk Glove, a smutty book from Campaign 2, which we saw Pike looking early at in Grimmel's shop. Jarrett summons the group to the Cloud Talk District. Here, this scene parallels the campaign. Sovereign Uriah has relinquished control over Taldore, transforming it from an empire to a republic. Oh yeah, more D20s overlook him on either side, also a reference to the Critical Role logo. This might be a bit of a stretch, but the podium Uriel speaks at seems to have a symbol of a V interlocked with an M. If so, this would be the symbol of Vox Machina. Vex's primeval awareness goes off. I'm sure other fans of Campaign 1, like me, started losing it through this whole scene, as it parallels exactly the events from Campaign 1, where Iman was attacked by four ancient dragons on the day Uriel abdicates his sovereignty. The episode ends as we get our first look at the Chroma Conclave, a group of powerful dragons that have banded together for one common purpose, domination. The dragons are Vorgal, Raishan, Umbrasil, and the big bad daddy dragon, Thordak. Remember, earlier on in the show, these events were foreshadowed when Vox Machina entered Brimside Slayer. Thordak is in fact the same red dragon that destroyed Vax and Vex's home, as well as the dragon who Lady and Laura references in, like, episode 2. And yeah, that's every easter egg and reference I could find in the Legend of Vox Machina episodes 10-12. to 12. Let me know in the comments below what I've missed. The animators are so good at hiding these easter eggs, it really feels almost impossible to consistently find them all. The Chroma Conclave arc has finally begun, and I just can't wait for more episodes of The Legend of Vox Machina. I've said this before, but it blows my mind how the show continues to only get better with each episode, but I guess I really shouldn't be too surprised seeing as I know the whole story of Campaign 1 and how the stakes are raised over and over and over again as it continues. As always guys, if you enjoyed the video or learned something new, make sure you like, comment, and subscribe. Check out our other Legend of Vox Machina easter egg videos, as well as my Legend vs. the Campaign series. Click on one of the videos on screen now, and I'll see you in the next one. As always guys, peace, love, adieu.